Okay, uh, Revelation lecture number 18, we're still on Revelation chapter 17. Look at Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 8. And uh, verse 14. Now God's bringing Ezekiel the prophet to the entrance of the gate of the, of the temple. Ezekiel 8 verse 14. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house which is toward the north. And behold, a woman was sitting there weeping for two months. God was trying to show Ezekiel how bad things had gotten in Jerusalem. He takes him to the temple where they're supposed to be worshiping the one true God, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And where the people doing their crying for the Muz, who was Samaritus' and Nimrod's little boy. So they were steeped in this mother son worship, this paganistic uh, Babylonian uh, artistry and, and apostasy of false religion. And a lot of that was, was due to God then sending the Babylonian Empire to, uh, to devastate. Uh, the uh, nation of Judah at that time. Uh, take a look a little bit further so you see how the, the Israelites dabbled with false worship or they did a lot more than dabbling with. Uh, Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah chapter 7 in verse 18. By the way, we talked about the problem with Roman Catholicism. Our church I started seven years ago, Trinity Bible Fellowship. And if we are around for 1,500 years, we were probably much, much worse than the Roman Catholic Church is today. The reason is because nobody signed from the Bible. Nobody granted the uh, infallibility. So the... the you know, a local church, and that's what I, I think it should just be kept at local churches. In other words, if I die, as long as you guys make sure the next pastor that fills the pulpit is a Bible believing preacher who's preaching the Word of God and it's not all the essentials on straight, then you can breathe a sigh of relief for the next generation. But if, if the day comes when a heretic takes the pulpit, it's time to get out of the Trinity Bible Pulpit and go to a different local church. Uh, but with Catholicism, because they had that authoritative, that, you know, an infallibility passed on, and, and strong authority even before infallibility got voted in in 1870, uh, they managed to keep the true identity of Christ and the essentials like that, although they added a lot of other garbage over the years. But in other words, if Trinity Bible Fellowship went 1,500 years, we would have the human element without uh, without the iron rod of authority to, to say you must believe this over here. And so it cuts both ways. Uh, in actuality, well, each and every generation of church has to be judged anew by, by who's buying the pulpit and what kind of teaching the church is, is giving. But take a look at Jeremiah. Chapter 7, verse 18. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle a fire, and the woman need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out libations to other gods in order to spite them. Uh, you can look further. There's also sacrifices offered. He mentions this throughout Jeremiah. Jeremiah 44, verses uh, 17 to 19, uh, he just talks about, we don't need to read it all. Uh, in verse 18 it says, But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out libations to her, we have lacked everything and have met our end by the sword and by famine. You see, supposing how long the prosperity movement, supposing by naming and claiming things in Jesus' name, you actually started getting things. 
Would that mean that once you find out you're in error, and you're interpreting scriptures incorrectly, would that mean that you still do it? That's what these people are saying. Hey, look, if worship in a false god works, we'll keep doing it, because we're getting, we're getting those goodies that we want. That he's prospering us. Uh, so God mentions even, even further down in verse 25, offering sacrifices to the Queen uh, of Heaven. Uh, Judges chapter 2 Well, we don't even need to turn to it. Judges chapter 2 verses 11 and 13 and 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 3 and 4 uh, they talk about the false worship of, of Baal and Ashtaroth and again that was a uh, uh a male, female deity type. Uh, and so we see that this kind of paganism even crept into uh, Israel as well. Uh, but the history of this Babylonian false religion, this mystery religion, if you will, that started with Nimrod and uh, had the mother-son worship that crept into even, even Roman Catholicism, uh, the history of this Babylonian false religion will be complete when the end time false church gives way to the Antichrist. Uh, when you look back in Revelation 17, in verse 6, it says, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered greatly. One thing that I can tell you about Roman Catholicism, uh, when you look at its history, and you, when you look at many of the people that the Roman Catholic Church over the centuries has put to death, and you read the views of these guys, there was a, a solid percentage of the guys that they put to death were put to death because they were true believers of Jesus Christ, and they made complaints about non-biblical things the church was doing. Uh, so if Roman, uh, the church of Rome, if Roman Catholicism is going to become the end time false church, the one world religious system, uh, it would fulfill verse 6 very easily in that, uh, uh, she has shed the blood of the saints throughout the centuries. However, if Rome isn't the end time false church, okay, uh, whatever end time false church comes in is going to shed the blood of the saints with the Antichrist. So this does not necessarily prove that Rome did, but I think Rome has got the structure. I, when I started holding it, even when I left Rome to I said, no, nah, no way, no way, the, the reformers were wrong, the reformers were wrong. But when I found out that when Ronald Reagan brought down communism, and it turned out that it was because he was in meetings, secret meetings with the Pope, and the two of them decided how they could bring down the thousand by the, uh, bring down communism by the Catholic Pope, getting guys like Wetlanza and Poland to get the Catholic people to take a stand against it, and then all of a sudden the, the uh, uh, Soviet Union crumbled, uh, I had thought that, the, the, that all the power, all the political power that the Roman Church had, I thought was gone centuries ago, and apparently uh, I was mistaken. And uh, and so that's when I saw them as a viable candidate, but no, it is, it's, it's, it's their, their direct military power is no longer. Yeah, and then you, and then you make that indirect. Yeah, you know, even even the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, they were actually started as a commando unit to lead people to Roman Catholicism at the point of the sword. Uh, but now they've become the intellectual defenders of Catholicism, or at least it's supposed to some of them don't hypothesize uh, 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 some of the biggest problems. But some of them have been great defenders of. Uh, Catholicism and even the uh, Christian like uh, Frederick Copperston. Yeah. But you know what it's just some of the real liberal churches down there and in the body that's the defendant side of God and yeah. there's a few similarities between the two of that. Yeah. 
Well, he, the thing is, there are certain, one of the toughest, let's say Roman Catholicism, and then they're getting into this, let's bring everybody back into the church even if they disagree. They're getting into that type of thinking right now. The toughest people to bring in would be New Agers, because if they're the pantheists, if they're not theistic, they're not far from Christianity as you can get, and the Muslims. Because they're convinced they're the ones who faith. Well, the two open doors they have there, the open door they have with the New Agers, is this elevation of Mary, for all practical purposes, to the point of worship. Uh, the women's livers and the, those that are in Wicca, modern witchcraft, that are worshiping the earth goddess, they, they, yeah, they, you could see them going for this type of thing because they've got the female deity right there. Uh, but with the Muslims, what I found out was in the time of Portugal, when Mary supposedly appeared, the Muslims had taken over Portugal when Muhammad was alive, and Muhammad named it. I believe it was while he was alive, but it was named after Muhammad's favorite daughter who died when she was young, died before Muhammad did, and her name was Fatima, and he said that she is the greatest woman in heaven except Mary. So when the supposed Mary visited Fatima, because of it, any statue of Mary that is a statue of Our Lady of Fatima, uh, Muslims will bow before it to this day. Um, so, I don't know. Is there an open door there to Islam? I don't know. It's real hard to say. Um, because they are about as uh, exclusive as, as Christians are, as true Christians are, that they will not accept any other faith. Um, anyway, that's the vision there. And so that's just this mystery behind this Babylon the Great, the mother of Harlots, and of the abominations of the earth, uh, the, the, the false religious system, the kind of the mystery, you know, with, with uh, the Antichrist is talking about you know, the, the mystery of lawlessness that's at work. Uh, well, this is kind of the mystery of false religions uh, that is at work. Uh, the vision is explained in verses 7 to 18. Uh, the beast, uh, verses 7 to 8, and the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I said, Tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder whose name they will wonder whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that he was and is and is not and will come. Uh, the beast, the harlot rides this beast, but later on she is cast out. The rulers of the beast's kingdom actually knock her off her horse, if you will. But she's right, she's saying, hey, I could use this one world government to further my goal. Well, apparently the beast is saying, I could let this one world religion ride me and further my goal, and then when I don't need her anymore, I can watch her. Uh, but the beast comes out of the abyss. Uh, what, is it later in this chapter? Or no, it was the last chapter. Remember the beast? The, 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 the beast who was the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the, uh, and Lucifer himself, they are, there's three unclean spirits come out of them like frogs. So the Antichrist is possessed not primarily by Lucifer, but by a separate demon than Lucifer. And apparently this demon comes out of the abyss, so we know it's not Lucifer. Lucifer is not going to be cast into the abyss uh, until Jesus Christ returns. He'll be cast there for a thousand years, and that's going to be during the millennial reign of Christ. Then he'll be released, and there'll be the final Satan's last revolt, or his last stand, as he marches those who are growing up during the Millennium Kingdom to decide to side with him on Jerusalem, and then Jesus defeats him and throws him into the lake of fire. 
he stays forever and ever. Uh, so this demon comes out of the abyss, possesses the Antichrist as of the beast is, and this could be the false resurrection here that they wondered how he died. He was, they was not, that he is, and the world falls and the wonder it. Could be the false resurrection spoken about in Revelation 13, verse 3. Uh, then again, it just could be that maybe, the, see, the beast means both the end time world government and the ruler of that end time world government. So it can mean either one, depending on the context. So it could be that it just the Roman Empire died, it was gone, and all of a sudden they got revived in the last days. But it seems that people are going to worship it are, I think, some type of false resurrection. If John F. Kennedy had risen a, a week later or three days later after his death and then said he was God and demanded to be worshipped, I bet he would have got a significant number of people to follow him. Uh, but the Antichrist's accomplishments, his, his resume is going to be a lot sharper than that. And uh, so I, I see some type of false resurrection. Uh, but the beast says it will be destroyed by Christ, uh, but non-believers will be deceived by him. Now the seven heads are explained in verses 9 to 11. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has yet not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth, and is one seven, and he goes to destruction. So the seven heads are seven different world empires that also have shared in false religion throughout the ages. Uh, but not only are they seven different world empires, they're also the seven hills of Rome. It's got kind of a double meaning here. Uh, seven hills, the only city that we know that was famous for having seven hills was Rome. Uh, Babylon, not the case. Uh, you know, so many other cities that people have proposed. Uh, seven hills in Rome, even on their coins. In fact, I even, uh, I don't think I listed them here, uh, but uh, I, I have certain maps that actually list the seven, the names of the seven hills in Rome. So it's definitely pinpoint Rome, and that's why I think, again, and, uh, a world religion with much gold that persecuted the saints, uh, royalty headquartered in Rome, you know, it sounds like Vatican City. Uh, as the number one candidate. Could be wrong, but, but that's what it sounds like. Uh, but the, it says also that the seven heads stand for five, for the seven kings. Five have fallen. Now again, this was, remember the ones that I listed on the board, Egypt? You, you, if you view it as the kings that persecuted the nation of Israel, then the five that fell would be Egypt, then uh, Assyria, then Babylon, then the Middle Persian Empire, and then Greece. And then they were acquired at fell, and then one is, John says, so that's the Roman Empire. That makes six. One is yet to come. That's the revived Roman Empire. Which could be the United States of Europe right now. And then there's an eighth that is yet to come, but it's still a train of the seven. That's basically just the revived Roman Empire after the assassination attempt of the Antichrist when he he probably, Satan's probably going to give him the same choices that he gave to Christ. I'll give you all my kingdom, the whole earth, if you just worship me. And I'll protect you with one of my top ranking demons and all. And so it takes on a whole other dimension. So it's still a seven. It's still a seven. Uh, but it's, it's so different that you can call it an eight. In fact, this, this divide, the one that right here gave the Jews the right to practice their 
their sacrifices in the temple. Uh, but what the Antichrist the kingdom possesses is the slaughter of the Jews and they're not allowed. So that, that would be the seven and then the, the eight would be the, the seven one as well. Uh, however, that's if, if it's in relation to Israel. If it's not in relation to Israel, if it's just the following war from the, the Babylonian false religion type, then it would be the ancient Babylonian Empire instead of Egypt. Okay? So, there's some speculation that first one would be the Egypt or Babylon, because Egypt really didn't reign over as wide a territory as he does. He does the world empire. Egypt really was, but they did dominate the Jews. So, I would probably favor the ancient Chaldean or ancient Babylonian Empire, then Assyria, then Babylon, then the Middle Persian, then the Greek. Greek Empire, and that was the part that had fallen. The one that is during John's time was the Roman Empire, the one that's yet to come, the revived Roman Empire, and then once the Antichrist is demon possessed, uh, and they start persecuting the Jews, that's an eighth, but it's really the seventh. Uh, so, uh, the five kings that fell, we mentioned them, the one king that is the Roman Empire of John's day, the one, that yet, the one that's yet to come, the revived Roman Empire, combined with the apostate church. And the eighth king is when the Antichrist outs the, outs the apostate church. Now, well, that, that's questionable. That's just full of that. Some believe that right at the midway point, he outs the apostate church. He, man, he replaced it with himself. With himself, yeah. And that's a tough one. That because well, remember, I mean, he just kind of evolved it. He was he made himself ahead of it. It, it, it. it could be that's when they when he comes to power. It could be that's when they give him his allegiance. Well, that's and saw in England when when the when they went to the Church of England instead of the, the Church of Rome, he didn't come to win and, and, and took it over and saw the head of the Church of England. That's all the same matter. Yeah, yeah. The same thing. So yeah. So, yeah, see, the false prophet, some guys think the false is going to be the Antichrist. I doubt it. I, it it's, it's a tough one. And uh, I think at the most, the false could be maybe a false prophet who backs the Antichrist, kind of a John the Baptist, Jesus type relationship with him. Except John the Baptist said, don't follow me, follow Jesus, because he's God. Uh, yeah, but I think this would be more, don't follow me, follow him, he's God, I'm just saying it because this guy's got more power, than, more demonic power than I got. So I think, I think the, I don't think the, I think it's going to be, be the public, the public, no, no, the public image would definitely be the John the Baptist, what I'm saying is the, uh, the humility of John the Baptist is not going to be there in that yeah. false prophet, whoever he is. Um, but anyway, the ten horns are, are described and explained in verses 12 and 13. And the ten horns, as you saw, are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. They have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So the ten kings of the revived Roman Empire uh, could be ten nations in the United States. United States and Europe. Right now they got about 13 or 14. Uh, but there is another possibility. I'm writing it into my notes right now. Uh, when, when they wanted the United States and Europe, the European community, when they wanted to start, they, they used to, at one time, they were just the, the European Economic Community, the EEC. But their goal was to become the United States of Europe, one empire. On paper, they are one empire right now. The difference between going from France to Spain is like the difference between going from New Jersey to New York now. It's not like the difference between going from America to Canada. Well, the only exception there is the currency of the Yeah, and yeah, but, 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 but even there, they try, what did they drop? Uh, they dropped something in between two. In between the two, that was well, there's no more character. Yeah, no more character. Okay, and uh, the uh, when they wanted to start the European economic community, 
in Brussels, the one of their headquarters, and mainly it's headquartered out of Rome, though. But when they wanted to start one of their headquarters in Brussels, they had ten, still do to this day, ten flagpoles flying, and they only had six nations. They said, why do you got ten flagpoles? Because you want ten nations. Some, we might go over ten, we might have less than ten, but in the end we want Europe broken down into one unified United States of Europe, ten nations. Well, now they got the United States of Europe, and they got, I think, something like 12 nations or 13, and it's possible on about 14 or 15. They're either going to get that, they, either they are the ten kings, so you got the seven heads and ten horns for the, well, even that can throw for a loop. Either the ten kings are going to be based in Europe, or there's another possibility. I believe in either. I think it was 1968 when the Club of Rome got together. They met in Rome, and there were a bunch of one worlders trying to get the United Nations to be this one world government and all. And they broke the world down into ten different regions. So it could be the fact that it starts in Europe, makes it the revived Roman Empire, but then it's going to spread as Europe did throughout the whole inhabited Earth. This is going to spread throughout the whole inhabited Earth, which is takes on the whole globe, so that the ten kings of ten kingdoms might be ten regions throughout the whole world, the United States included. Um, and that's what the Club of Rome wanted to do. So you got two possibilities there. It could be the ten kings could be ten kings of uh, the United States of Europe, or they could be ten kings from all over. The United States might be might become one of the ten kings. Uh, so it's a real tough one to call there, but they are the ten kings of the Revival of the Empire. I'll lock up when I leave the Well, what I wanted to tell you, we have a teacher down in the city right now mm-hmm. that has 9 o'clock and 9 15 appointments. Oh, okay. Now, so check the city right room before you go out. Okay. You see, you still have those that you are. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. okay. All right, good deal. And, uh, I hope that there's one royalty is not as dumb as Okay, okay, uh, that was, uh, for those who are listening out to set, that was, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich stopped by and uh, asked for little advice, little political advice. Little. Okay, verse 14. Uh, these will wage war against the Lamb. Thank things will wage war against the Lamb, Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lamb will overcome him because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and the chosen and faithful. And uh, so the revived Roman Empire will war with Christ, but Christ will crush the revived Roman Empire. And it's going to rule the earth for a thousand years. We'll look into that when we get to Revelation chapter 20. Christ's followers are referred to as faithful, but the heart of it is unfaithful. Uh, verse 15, the waters that the heart of Sitz upon are mentioned. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the heart of Sitz are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And, uh, so the waters that the heart of Sitz upon are symbolic of all the non-believers of the world. Uh, they will join the apostate one world church. Okay? It's just, it's just a way of saying the waters are the, the Gentiles the non-Jews, people from all nations. Uh, verses 16 and 17, And the ten horns that you saw, and the beasts, these will hate the harlot. So you have the Roman, the Bible Roman Empire really doesn't like the end time world church. They're, they were using her, even though she was riding them and steering them at first. Now they're figuring, hey, now we're in position to knock her off and do our own thing. And the ten horns that you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their heart to execute his purpose by uh, having a common purpose, and by giving their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God should be fulfilled. And uh, so the revived Roman Empire will use the apostate church to gain power, but then they'll destroy the apostate church. It becomes desolate, naked, eaten, burned. Uh, the Antichrist will then assume, well, if this is at the halfway point, then he assumes all power. Revelation 13, 5. 
and claim, he claims to be God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 or 4. So this happens right at the midpoint. You know, if leading into the tribulation, if he's to go into the loose, but then at the halfway point when he claims to be God, he, uh, he, uh, tears up the, uh, end time fall church, then it would occur there at that point. Uh, but unknowing the ten kings are going to serve God's purpose by giving the kingdom uh, to the Antichrist here, if that is the case. Now, the, the other possible scenario is that they come in cahoots at the halfway point or somewhere uh, in it, but it happens later in the tribulation, they decide to, to wipe out the end-time false church. So, so if they wipe out the end-time false church, such as, in, let's say it's Roman Catholicism, if they wipe out the Roman Catholic hierarchy, they still keep a end time false religion of their own. Uh, and so it's real tough to say what is what is given here. If the if this is at the halfway point or if this is much later on in the tribulation period. And when the Antichrist issues the mark of the beast and he's being worshipped, is that still part of the harlot religion? Or is that the point where the break is made between the two? And so that that's open to debate. I, I mean, if I, to be honest with you, if I really had to guess, my guess would be that uh, the worship of the Antichrist is, is part of this apostate end time world church, and that it's just much later for political reasons that her hierarchy is uh, is devastated. Uh, the woman, the harlot, is mentioned in verse 18, and the woman you saw is the great city, seven, city of seven hills, Rome, is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And when John wrote that, there was only one city that fit that description right there, and it was Rome. Um, Peter even refers to Rome as Babylon, and I believe Second Peter. It was a code name for, for Rome, so they, you know, it was very common for your mail to be searched. You give, I'd write a letter, give it to John, and then John's got to bring it uh, to Jeff. Well, some of those soldiers can just stop and say, wait, you're one of those Christians. And they make sure that your letter doesn't have any anti-Rome propaganda. And you just read it. And so a lot of times they would write letters, but the code, the common code was by early Christians for Rome was Babylon. They used an ancient, uh, ancient city that was the center of false religion and uh, world empire uh, for it. That's Revelation 17. Let's move right on to Revelation 18 and try to lay some, uh, some ground there. Now, again, the, the two possibilities here is that Revelation 17 and 18 both deal with the same event destruction of the great city, which would be wrong. So some, some say it's a rebuilt Babylon, but I just think the evidence is against it. It doesn't have seven hills. It wasn't a great city at the time John was writing. Uh, so it could be, one possibility the Revelation 17 or Revelation 18 both deal with the same event, the destruction of the great city of Rome, uh, which is the headquarters of the end time wall church. Um, the other possibility is that Revelation 17 strictly deals with the fall of ecclesiastical Babylon, or, you know, ecclesiastical Rome, while Revelation 18 strictly deals with the fall of political Babylon. So in other words, in Revelation 17, Rome was devastated, but just to knock off the, the Pope or whoever the leader is there. But in Revelation 18, it's the Antichrist, his kingdom is getting knocked off. So two possibilities there, and it depends what they have to leave. I, I, I'm kind of favoring more and more, and they both deal with the same event. Uh, that even when it says God is judging Rome, uh, he's using, just as I said right in this earlier passage, he's using the ten kings. Uh, to actually fulfill his purpose when they purpose to destroy it. And then the second coming of Christ is real clear in Revelation 19 that Jesus takes out the Antichrist and the false prophet and the king and 
the political aspect. Revelation 19. Look at Revelation 18. Uh, verses 1 to 3 talk about the fall of Babylon being announced. Now, it starts off after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with foot. Now, after these things, does that mean after the destruction of the ecclesiastical Babylon, then we're going to see the destruction of uh, political Babylon? Or does after these things just mean now we're going to get our second glimpse? Are you mentioned with the Chronicles and Kings distinction, a second glimpse of the same event. So again, it's real tough. So another angel from heaven with great authority, the earth is illumined with his glory, so he comes from right from God's presence. His proclamation in verse 2, and he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. And uh, so the angel announces that Babylon the Great has fallen. Babylon, in Rome, has become the home of demons, unclean spirits. And bird is just another symbolic word for the angel. The union is apparently the Jesus. Bird is symbolic of demons. Verse 3. For all the nations have drunk, still the proclamation of the angel, for all the angels have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. The kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sexuality. Uh, so nations, kings, and merchants commit immorality with Babylon the Great. Uh, this isn't talking about physical immorality, it's talking about spiritual immorality. Uh, Unethical practices are probably included, but the main emphasis is on idolatry and the worship of the false gods. Uh, verses 4 and 5, God calls his people to evacuate Babylon. A call for the people of God to evacuate Babylon. Verses 4 and 5. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive her of her plagues. Uh, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Uh, so a voice from heaven calls God's people to leave Babylon, to leave Rome. Uh, we have the same type of thing in Jeremiah 51, verses 44 to 45. The same type of thing in Genesis chapter 19, verses 15 to 22. God therefore lot his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, but he calls his people to leave Babylon which is wrong to escape her sins and her plagues. The plagues could be the, the bowl of Revelation 16. I don't know. It's, it's real tough to say. Uh, God's people too, you know, at, they're in Rome. They're, they've got to have some friends who are non-believers who have the mark who are somehow taken care of them. But it, it's amazing when you read the stories of uh, even during the uh, World War II, and some of the Jewish people hiding in places in, in, in Germany and uh, living in, in hidden rooms and, and houses and being able to survive so long. Uh, but her sins were piled up as high as heaven. It's just like the tower, you know, it, it kind of alludes to the uh, Tower of Babel piling up as high as heaven. God has remembered uh, Babylon, her iniquities, and uh, you know, God promised Jeremiah 31, 34, the new covenant that he would make with his people, the Jewish people, that once they turn back to him, uh, their iniquities uh, and their sins he would remember no more. But here Babylon is unrepentant, so God remembers her iniquities, and only ju judgment is all that she has to look at. Uh, look forward to. Uh, verses 6 to 8, the judgment against Babylon. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds, and the cup which she has missed, missed twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensually, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day, her plague will come. 
pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. Now, it's referring to Babylon as a her. And it makes it sound a lot like, you know, there's no chapter break there, it makes it sound a lot like he's the same woman, the same city. And so though the harlot, the woman, is both the anti fall church and the city, and so it makes it hard to see two different judgments. If there are two different judgments, then it's the bowl of God's wrath that are wiping her out, but if God is judging her through the ten kings and they burn her with fire, then it's the leaders of the uh, revived Roman Empire that actually take her out. That, that's what's real tough about this passage. Um, now, if I was down with town from Liberty University, a test on the test you would have, Revelation 17 refers to ecclesiastical Babylon, and Revelation 18 refers to political Babylon, true or false. And I told you it could go either way. But Elmer Cowell, the Liberty University, always would say, hey, it's true in one sense, but in another sense, hey, it's false. And then on the text, you would see, hey, it's true, it's true or false. And it's like, man, a lot of what was this guy trying to do? And, uh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, usually, you pray for two false tests, but for him, you pray for that thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, I think I would have, uh, I tell you though, I always did better than I thought on the test. So I think that they... You did get a credit either way. He, 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 he <laughs> didn't get a credit either way, or he meant it one way, and it was so vague, and I got so many complaints, that they would just grade it right and take either one on it, because it's obviously, he's got the problem, not that he... He wasn't great in his own past, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a big, yeah, big wig over there. He's one of the two vice presidents for that. Okay, uh, his judgment against the, he's a great guy, but his name is Elmer, so right away you think of Elmer Fudd, he's got a bald head, and he's got a, 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 a lisp. Okay, so, yeah, and it's, it's, a dynamite guy, he's just a real, real godly man. Never, never, Never in a bad mood. Uh, but anyway, the judgment against Babylon's eye decides to pay them back double. So it's, it's even more than an eye for an eye, you know, it's two eyes for an eye. Uh, Babylon glorified herself, called herself a queen. Babylon lived sensuously, and her plague will come uh, on one day. Pestilence, there will be mourning, famine. Uh, Babylon will be destroyed with fire. Now, Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17, it said that the ten kings would wipe out Babylon, uh, the, the woman, uh, and would fulfill God's purpose by doing it. So that might be the same thing. But if the Lord is judging her, but is it the Lord judging her separately after ecclesiastical Babylon were even wiped out, or are they the same event as the Lord judging her through the ten kings? Who were slamming her there. Uh, the kings of the earth mourn, verses 9 and 10 of Revelation 18. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sexually with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes uh, anymore. Actually, I read one verse too many from there. Uh, the kings of the earth mourn. They committed acts of immorality with her, so that they are t- taken a false worship. They have lived sexually with her. They will weep and mourn because they see Babylon uh, burn. So, you know, their, their prophets are out the window. Uh, the kings will keep their distance for fear of the torment. In one hour, the city of Babylon can judge against cities is most likely wrong. Uh, the merchants of the earth, oh, and the kings of the earth, mourning in verses 9 and 10. Uh, and now verses 11 to 19, actually, the merchants, so the ones who are really making the big profit are verses 11 to 19. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. 
Armors of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet. And every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargo and horses and chariots and slaves and human lives and the fruit you long for has gone from you and all the things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like uh, the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by the wealth. For one hour she has been laid waste. So they will weep, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over Babylon's fall, for no one buys their cargoes any longer. Uh, they had become rich through it. Several many things are mentioned, the gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, citron wood, ivory, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, perfume, frankincense, wine, olive oil, flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, Horses, chariots, slaves, and human lives. Uh, Babylon's luxuries will be destroyed. Now, Matthew 6, 19 and 20 really comes in really good here. It's a message we always need to, to look at over and over again just for our own lives, especially living here in America around the prosperity. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy or with thieves break and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break and steal. Verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, neither he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man and man and the words for riches. You cannot serve both God and riches. It's either one or the other. That doesn't mean it's a sin to be rich, but it means it's a sin. Uh, and it's idolatry to make uh, wealth in your God. Uh, you make some good ground there and mark down where we